Mina Cummings grew up in a Camellia family in towns like Udnadatta and Marie in South Australia. She has a remarkable memory of a unique childhood where she travelled long distances beside the camels, riding her favourite camel Raja with her Afghan-born father and her memories of their regular Muslim worship. The Camellias were brought to Australia from Afghanistan and Pakistan in the 1800s to run camel trains that carried supplies to outlying settlements. They lived on the edge of town in what was known as Gantown. They often mixed with local Aboriginal people who were also living on the outskirts of town. Here's Adrian Shaw, Nazmina's grandnephew, with the ships of the desert. <laughs> The Europeans were dependent on the Afghans. There was a Gan town in Farina, there was a Gan town in Mari. strong camels. On either side of us there were uh, Afghans. Those Afghans were our, our friends, you know, they our friends and neighbours. It was that reliability of getting a message through. Corrugated iron was what everybody built within those days. See, the Afghans lived, they all lived to great ages. 98 and 99 years. It's not unusual for Afghans. And my dad was well over 90. In the 1800s, Afghans were arriving in Australia with their camels. From the deserts of Afghanistan, Pakistan and the Mideast, the Afghans and their camels were a reliable form of transport, crossing the deserts of inland Australia, delivering supplies. It was at the end of the train lines where the Afghan camel drivers made their temporary homes of galvanised iron. They camped on the edge of the settlements in what became known as Gantowns. Nasmina Cummings is my auntie, second generation Afghan who grew up in these Gantowns. She also grew up travelling on her father's camel train with her four older sisters, Annie Vera, Annie Rose, Annie Bibi and my grandmother, Nana Dolka. This is my auntie Nasmina's story. Her father, Fiat Muladad, who is my great-grandfather was a devout Muslim, like many other Afghans, pausing for prayers in the desert. Before settling down in his Gan towns, the Admuladad met his wife May, picking fruit on the Murray River. Only Nesmina grew up in the Gan towns of Farina, Mare, Alice Springs in Central Australia, and Udnadatta. My name is Nazmina. I'd like to tell you my story of my childhood on the Afghan camel trains. I'm sitting in the, the dining room in my villa in a place called Budrum in central Queensland. My father came out to Australia about 1899 or thereabouts. Before he came into central Australia to take up the camel teams, he did work in Mildura grape picking and there he met my mother. She was English and her father had a vineyard just outside of Mildura on the Murray River. And they met, even though he didn't speak English and my mother didn't speak Afghani, somehow they fell in love. After about six months, they married and she left with my dad. And she had no hesitation in going. But her family was so furious about this that they never ever spoke to my mother again. And she was left alone to make her life with my dad. Uh, my mother all the time, I might add, uh, that she was with my dad. She still remained a Christian, and he never ever instigated that she should become a Muslim. Uh, they didn't do that. 
that was something that you made up your own mind to be. And even though Mum made all the Afghan shrouds and uh, helped them in any way that she could, she still remained a Christian. When she rode the camels, she didn't ride uh, ride the camels uh, stride. She always rode side saddle. The saddle was quite comfortable and Mum made it very comfortable with cushions and things like that and she rode side saddle. And she always had a, a hood over the top of the... Uh, of the uh, saddle to keep the shade in. And she always had a tucker bag uh, with the um, damper and um, cold meat and water, which I was able to have a meal travelling because we only had one meal in the day and that was when we made camp at night. Yes, they were asked to come out here. Uh, they were given uh, passage out here. Oh, I think the first Afghan came out here in 1840 and uh, they came out with no knowledge of the country at all and went straight out back and started uh, with the camel teams. But I can remember my father and my uncle, and my uncle was one of the early Afghans that came, they all had to travel steerage. It was way down in the bowels of the ship. The steerage was where the animals go. That's where the Afghans slept. But apparently it was quite clean and they might just have their beds and bed rolls on. And they had their meals down there. The ones that came out, I don't think they were, any of them were married. My father was quite a young person. I don't think any of them were married. When they came out, there was under 300, I believe, and not one Afghan woman came. And they were certainly not married. They wouldn't have left their wives. So the ones that came out, I would say, would be men that weren't married. I think it was just... Uh, probably fundamentally a natural adventurous way that the Afghans had. They were nomads anyway. I'm not saying all Afghans were nomads, but I know that our ancestors were nomads. They wandered the desert. I mean, why not wander across the sea and we'll see what's the desert on the other side? Nick Kimber is a freelance writer and researcher who has written several books on Aboriginal culture and numerous articles on the Afghans with their camel teams. Since 1970, Dick has lived in the Northern Territory and feels privileged to have lived with Aboriginal people in the Western Deserts. Dick published Man from Altunga in 1986 about the life of the oldest bushman in Central Australia, Walter Smith, who grew up on the camel trains with the Afghans. Dick discovered that camel teams also came from other countries near Afghanistan, but were all called Afghans. And it was profound knowledge that the Afghans had about their camels, which enabled them to establish their camel teams in Australia. No one knew how to handle camels at that time, so that's why the the Afghans and the people from Balochistan and Rajasthan, but nearly always under the umbrella of Afghans, came to Australia to assist because they knew first they knew how to handle the camels, which no one else did. They were able to train them. They knew the problems of their health, and they knew how to cure problems that no one else understood because there's you know, particular to camels, the amount of loading you can carry, where does it put the stresses on the camels. They had such an intimate knowledge of camels, thousands of years of knowledge that, in a way, you only can ever pass from generation to generation. Afghan men were quite dramatic in their appearance. They liked to be admired and used perfumed oils on their bodies, such as sandalwood and musk. They wore the loose flowing clothing, which was light coloured, perfect for the hot climate, accentuated with bright silks and embroidery. Their snowy white turbans were usually made from white muslin, which helped deflect the heat rays. They often presented an outlandish and exotic sight for journalists and professional men who would comment 
on how immaculate they were. They wore the white bloomers, the long white bloomers that came in at the ankles. And usually there was embroidery around the ankles. And over that was a long white shirt with a collar. Not a proper collar, but just a band around the neck, like a, uh, a mandarin neck, and buttoned down, which was unbuttoned. And long sleeves, which they usually rolled up. And of course, they were mostly big men too, big tall men. My father was one of the main ones that never wore a bloomer at some formal occasion. He'd put bloomers on, but usually he wore dungaree trousers with a long shirt over the top. Underneath the turban, they had their embroidered caps. Some were round caps and some were the pointed caps. My father always wore a pointed cap and was all beaded and very beautiful. And they had different coloured turbans. Some of them were red and blue. And I think they did like to wear snowy white turbans too. Um, my father and my uncle, Said Sator, they had green turbans because they had both been to Mecca. Udadatta is set on a gibber plane, a great big flat gibber plane. And when I say gibbers, I mean the whole thing was stones. You walked on stones. You walked barefooted on stones, small round gibber stones, with no trees and practically no vegetation. And consequently, you didn't have flocks of birds and things. Now and again, you'd hear a flock of galahs coming from the creek, and that was a good three and a half, four miles away. That would be the nearest place for birds to settle. There were, there was, there were no big trees anywhere for birds. No vegetation at all. And I could see for five miles all around me, I could look and look straight into the desert. The Gan town in Udnadatta was quite a big Gan town. It was made by the Afghans because they, they were a close community and uh, they wanted to live their own life away from the Ferengi. They call the white men the Ferengi. That's uh, Afghani for white person. Gan town was maybe a 50 or 100 houses at Udnadatta and it was made out of, out of corrugated iron. Uh, it must have been very hot in, in the corrugated iron. I suppose it was, but I don't remember my mother and sisters ever complaining about the heat. And there was wood stoves besides. I remember my mum fanning herself with newspapers. But um, in the summertime, a lot of your, your, your life was spent outside, out the back door. There could have been an open veranda or something like that, but you spent it outside. You could put your beds outside with a mosquito net, actually outside in the yard, and you'd catch whatever breeze there was. And uh, the women in Afghan town visited quite a lot. If somebody was having a baby, all the other women would come and they'd be making clothes and bringing food. And, you know, it was close to the community, very close. Ramadan is the Afghan Christmas, celebrated just like the ordinary Christian Christmas. They'd put up huge big marquees. When I mean huge, I'd be 20, 40 feet wide and a good 200, 250 Afghans and the young men would gather there. They all had their Quran and they usually had it in their private belongings and was always wrapped in silk. It was always wrapped up. It wasn't just, it wasn't just like a Bible that you see now. The Quran was just was, was wrapped up and wrapped up and wrapped up in different various rolls of various silks and it was revered and put away in a safe place. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem, bismillahi rahman rahim. Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan wa kina azab al-nar. Wa kina azab al-qabri wa kina azab al-hashri wa kina azab al-meezan. Rabbana la tuzi qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan wa inna kanta al-wahab. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Let's start the cooking early. They'd have great big cooking pots, beef and probably goat. Could have anything up to two dozen chooks, chopped up, ready to cook. Onions, capsicums, beautiful curry, made curry powder they made. And uh, the men would do all the cooking. The women never went there at all. They never went there. And the men would all be there. That was their gathering time. And they looked forward to it. And they'd gather early in the morning and hot chapatis were made golden syrup, they love golden syrup on chapati. 
and plenty of butter. Oh, and the butter. I mean, butter was bought by the boxes. The whole of their cooking was done in butter. And uh, during the day, when the curries were cooked, there was a choice of curries. You know, you could have beef curry or goat curry or chicken curry. I can remember the curries were absolutely fragrant. You know, they had a fragrance that you can't get now. Fragrances that they, in those days, they could actually get from Afghanistan. And cloves and things like that. It was absolutely lovely curry. Beautiful. When those tents were up, they put canvas down. And then they got mats and uh, then a cloth over. And then all around the outside was cushions. And the meals were put in the front in huge big plates, huge big plates. I mean, when I mean huge, they were about three or four feet long, some of them. And then, then there was the rice. It was all piled up in the middle and they'd all sit around and they'd eat from their fingers. And then all the families, the women would be all home at their various homes. And the young boys would, um, well, they'd all be there with the men because they, you know, they were very close to their fathers. And they, um, they did all the running with the food to the families. In their, they'd have their basins, probably two or three basins for each family, and they'd have the rice and probably a chicken curry and, you know, the different curry, and they'd bring it home and set, well, run all those back to their homes. The Afghans preferred big bull camels to carry supplies, but around breeding time, the bull camels would cause problems. The big bull camels were very huge animals. They'd stand head and shoulders above a car. Most ordinary Japanese cars, they'd be almost double in height. It's like having a great big Mack truck, loading it up. My father at times, and, and uh, my uncle stayed to talk, he had more than a 50 camels. There'd be times when they had more than 50 camels in one camel train. No, oh, it might be 80, perhaps 70. And the Afghans did like them because they could carry heavy loads. And also when a bull camel was, was starting to come into season, he'd become quite troublesome. They got a blubber coming out of their mouths and they were very, very dangerous. Try and get rid of other male camels and try and keep all the females in the cells. And that's why if there was a female with a young calf, the first thing the breeding camel would do would go and kill that male calf. So the mother would know this and she would get her calf and take and hide it away in the bush. And the Afghans knew that and they protected the calf too. And they avoided any trouble by loading him up very well so that he carried heavy loads and he got very, very tired. That would slow them down. That was a slow travelling camel team. And that's how, a lot of times how they kept them in check. But they could carry over a ton. This one, we're talking about a huge, big, strong and very strong animal. The most important thing about camel carrying was the loading. And you had to balance the loads. The balancing of it was crucial. Without that, your camels were going to get sore hips and throw themselves one side. It was going to be straining them. So balancing the load was important. And so if you have a windmill, You've got to have it in sections, but you've got to balance it up. So you might have to have the biggest sections on one side, then balance it with the smaller sections and the big blade mm. on the other side. One of the biggest loads they ever carried were the wool bales. And you see pictures of these camels loaded with, you know, the wool bales were conventionally one on each side for a fairly easy load, but that's, you know, wool bales are pretty big bales. Then you have four on a camel, and there's some pictures where they... They were testing the strength of them and they'd have eight on them. Uh, big rolls of barbed wire had to be carried so you had these struts on the side that lifted the weight of the bags or the weight of the rolls of wire or anything else off the camel's hide and also uh, you padded it as much as you could with old rags or, or hessian or whatever which was plentifully available in those days. Yeah, the saddles that went over the hump of the camel. Camels got saddle sores which they had to be treated they had special medicine they made themselves. The camel had to be treated and uh, the sores would heal up naturally. Because a camel with a sore back was a camel out of commission. And uh, that, you know, was the less camels they had with the less money th they made. The hardest thing of all was salt, because salt's so fine that if you've got the slightest pinprick in the bag, of course, the salt would start to leak out, but then the weight of it would cause the split to go. So you always double bagged salt in the old Hessian bags that were quite strong and did everything to protect the salt 
The other dilemma was, of course, if it rained and you had salt or sugar uh, or other things that spoiled, they were at the highest risk, so you had to be able to stop once it started raining and cover things up, put a few branches down on the ground to act as a little barrier to any moisture on the ground and make sure that you minimise the amount of moisture. Although the Afghans used big bull camels to carry the supplies, they also had their own riding camels. Ani Nazmina rode up on her father's camel, Raja. He was uh, not a camel that my father used for carrying heavy loads and things. He was a riding camel, and my father was very fond of him. He was babied in a kind of way. He was like a, having a champion race horse. And he was, too. He looked every bit a, uh, an aristocrat camel to look at. And when we were getting close to a station where uh, my father was carrying the uh, loading to, from a distance you could see the, uh, the, the station roofs. And uh, Baba, my father, would say, well, I'm going ahead and getting them ready for unloading. He and Raju would set off racing and they'd be at the station a good two or three hours before we arrived there. My father needed him for anything fast that needed to be done and he needed to go ahead. It was called going ahead. Well, he would leave the team behind and he would go ahead on Raja because he'd just call out, I'm going ahead. And we'd know that he's going ahead to a station. Raja was a beautiful looking camel. I don't know what happened to him, whether he was sold for breeding or... Well, what happened with my father was very fond of him. I know he was, a very, he was a very swift, very graceful kind of a camel. He had long, kind of uh, slender racing legs, and he walked very, very gracefully. His uh, camel skin was um, of a very light blonde look about it. He really was a very fast camel. You rode on Raja with your dad to go ahead. Um, what did it feel like? as a young kid, riding on Raja with your dad? Well, you felt very secure because you were with dad, you know. I mean, it was a privilege. I just loved it because it made you feel very important because you were going ahead with Baba, what you call going ahead. For a small child, it's very, it's very important because you'd go ahead to a station and, you know, they'd see my father get off the camel and then this kid get off looking very important. <laughs> Probably weren't important, but you thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> For 40 years or more, the Afghans and their camels were regarded as the best form of transport. They became the cheapest way of delivering supplies to outback towns and stations. Their success created a lot of resentment with the European horse and bullock teamsters. The Europeans could not compete with the cheaper Afghan labour and cartage rates, and the horses and bullocks could not compete with the endurance and suitability of the camels working in the harsh desert. The Afghans invited Aboriginal people to work on the camel trains and with the economic conflict increasing, racism, fear and hatred began to erupt. There were raids on the camel camps by European teamsters and racist anti-Afghan propaganda was circulated. Frederick Vosper editor of the Coolgardy Minor newspaper in Western Australia, played on anti-Afghan feeling in his editorials and established an anti-Afghan league opposing the Afghan camel teams. Although the Afghans were receiving racial hatred themselves, they also didn't like how Aboriginal people were treated by the Europeans. A disrespect to Aboriginals, which the Afghans thought was not a good thing to do. And, you know, their attitude towards the Aboriginal women and things like that, it just wasn't appropriate. You just didn't do those things because they'd never accept that. They didn't like it. But the doctor in those days would never treat an Aboriginal. Not under any circumstances would a doctor or a nurse come near an Aboriginal. They were never treated by doctors or nurses. You don't argue with people like that, especially what those people were like in those days. They were just very ignorant people. Their minds didn't work that way, but the Afghans knew. And my mother, if there was any difficulties, my mother was the one that used to go, especially if there was an Aboriginal lady married to an Afghan, she would always go and see that the birth was okay. 
overall, looking at it generally, they didn't like their culture. It was different. They tried to bring that disrespect towards the Afghans also. If somebody didn't do anything to deserve disrespect, you don't give it out. Don't you think so? There were um, Aboriginals that were used to the camels, used to working with the camels, and uh, they would be employed by the Afghans. Usually about two they had, and usually the, the uh, Aboriginal men would bring their uh, wives with them and probably a couple of children. And the, uh, the Aboriginal men's wives, they, they could be riding or walking, whatever. Uh, they could walk beside my mum and talk, or they'd go catching guanas or lizards and things. We'd be there watching them catch it, and they'd just catch it and hit their head against the ground to kill them, then put it in their saddlebags and go on. Quite often when they got to camp, they would probably have a, a goanna or something like that, some of their Aboriginal food which they'd caught on the road, and they'd cook that on the fire and eat that. Olive Verva Brands is third-generation Chinese in Alice Springs. She also grew up in a corrugated iron house and recalls the sights of the camel trains when she was young. I am Olive Everbrance and I live at Burrell Court in Alice Springs. I remember a lot about the camels because my grandfather, Ah Hong, uh, had a bakery and a big market garden which stretched from Todd Street right down to the, uh, to the river. He grew all sorts of vegetables. He grew three varieties of grapes and he had chickens and ducks for sale and uh, grandfather had a corrugated iron house with a push-out window, you put a piece of wood in it to keep the shutter out, no-fly screens, and river sand floor. So we just lived on the river sand floors, and then we had wells. Everybody had a well. When my grandfather put the pump on to pump water up, and the water was pumped into troughs. For instance, if I looked down towards the river, there were camels there. The camels were hobbled. If people don't know what hobbled is, you put uh, something around their um, two of their legs so that they can't gallop away. They can walk around slowly and forage, but they can't gallop away. And that was a, a way of keeping them close to home. And uh, to me, a camel would be would be huge, but it was really part of our scenery, part of our life. <laughs> After travelling in the desert throughout the day, the Afghans would make their camp near a waterhole. The ball camels were unloaded, fires were lit, and meals were prepared. When they wanted to water the camels, they stopped at water. They camped at water. And that night the camels would drink water. But they wouldn't drink or stop in the daytime. And of course they always had prayers at night, and because they were devout Muslims. And... Uh, the uh, camels were put into a circle and unloaded in a circle. And then they were hobbled and let out to graze. And then the uh, fires were lit, the billies put on. The Afghans were great tea drinkers. And the curries put on, salmon curry and rice. But it was always a proper, organised, good meal because that was the only meal of the day, actually. And it was always beautifully done. And uh, the, uh, a canvas was put down with blankets and cushions and you sat down and um, had a proper meal. And the uh, Aboriginal family, enough food would be made and they'd come and get their food. That camp became a real home during the night. And then in the morning you're up early and the, one of the boys would go out and bring the camels in and unhobble them and hoist them down near their saddles and uh, they'd load again. Anything to eat in the morning was very quick. Or probably just cold damper or cold chapati. That's the flat bread, the Afghan's flat bread. Probably with jam or probably cold corned beef or something like that. But whatever it was, it was very quick because they'd started loading probably about five or six in the morning. By about half past seven, or sometimes earlier if it was very hot, they'd be well on the road. Once they started, they knew exactly where they were going and how they were going to get there. Each day was planned as if they had a map. 
I mean, when they used to go leave Alice Springs and head west right across to uh, nearly to West Australian border, I remember somebody once asking my dad how he, how he knew where to go, and he said, oh, I just followed the rangers. And a lot of times they had the Aborigines as camel boys, and I would say there would be wisdom in their thinking there too because they knew that the Aborigine would know the way. If they didn't, they'd soon find out. They knew that this was their land and they knew the land and they respected that knowledge. Sunrise and sunset were crucial. You had to make your stages a day but you had to be sensible over looking after yourself. So there's no use wearing yourself into the ground. You had to make camp just before sundown so you had time to get your firewood. You had the people who went ahead uh, to make sure of where the best camp was. Everyone knew where the stages were, so you went to the water holes and the bores that were crucial. I remember Mum, when she got to a water hole near where she all did her washing, and um, we had baths, and uh, the men had baths before they did prayers and things like that. And I can remember the Aboriginal children used to go swimming. But I think Mum was always very careful about going into water holes because she wasn't too sure how deep it was and that sort of thing. I did see water containers on, on, on camels. They were special sized galvanised iron water tanks that hung either side of the camels. They hung on either side of, and they were sort of a flattish shape, if you know what I mean? You wouldn't have a round shape hanging either side. They were galvanised iron made especially to lie on either side of the camel. <laughs> Unloading the bull camels in the evening and reloading them in the morning was strenuous lifting work. It created various health problems for the Afghans. Walking alongside the camel trains, only Nesmina and her sisters, including my nana Dolka, would get bending eye prickles in their feet. Travelling on the camel trains in the desert was dangerous work and the Afghans used traditional herbs for hundreds of medical problems. They used wild melons and the water from boiled nettle and dandelion leaves to prevent rheumatism and arthritis. Heart problems were treated and prevented with a plant called Persian Speedwell, which contained digitalis, a powerful coronary stimulant. Sometimes to diagnose an illness, they would look at their hands and fingernails to reveal the illness and determine the cure. During a particular trip on my great-grandfather's camel train, Fiyad Muladad had to save the life of an Aboriginal boy who became ill. One of my father's Aboriginals always bought a cheap ring from the shop, you know, those cheap brass rings, and he felt it on his finger because it was very tight, and the finger swelled up all around the ring. And by the time he told my father about it, he was quite a sick person because it had become inflamed and it started to get blood poisoning on the finger. There was literally nothing he could do. He knew that the blood poisoning had set in and the boy would die because he was sick. He'd actually become ill before he told my father what he'd done. He'd forced this ring on his finger and my father knew that that finger had to be amputated otherwise he was going to die. And of course they're way in the bush by the time this happened. He told the Aboriginal boy what he had to do, that I'll have to cut your finger off because if you don't you could die. And By the time we get to a station, well that's the only thing they can do too. You'd never get the ring off. The flesh had grown around it and into it. Anyway, and the boy started running away, so my father couldn't catch him. And he tried to chase him and get him back, but he couldn't catch him. He'd gone. And my father was so frustrated that he threw the knife at him. But uh, he uh, did the knives up so there wouldn't be any blood poisoning and things. It was just the finger was off and that was it. After that, they used to call my father Dr Mullerdad. <laughs> he used to laugh about it. It, oh, all the Afghans knew about it. And he was like, oh, there comes Dr. Mullerdad. <laughs> that was quite a common occurrence to have bindi eyes in your feet. And some of them were quite nasty. And if you didn't get them out, they'd fester and be quite sore. I mean, he didn't make a big deal of it. You simply sat down, twisted your foot around, and you had a safety pin. And... Uh, dug out the binny. Sometimes another child, if you had any problems, would come along and dig it out for you. Well, I mean, but you didn't have anything to put on it after. You just sort of walked on. And I don't remember anyone getting really bad foot. You just didn't make a big deal of it. It was just a binny eye that you got out. 
I'd say the average, a good low average, would be eight miles a day that they'd travel. A good day would be ten miles a day. We never wandered too far from the camel team, not while they were moving. And if we did, one of the boys looked behind, the Aboriginal men or my father, they'd always come, come and quickly hurry us up and make us catch up. Push, 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 push. Afghans were the same as anyone else. They were competitive. And if they got a job, say, take the loading from Tennant Creek to Dajara in Queensland, they went more or less straight across the Great Sand Plain Desert to the north of the Simpson Desert. But just about no one else went that way. What they did was they planted buffalo grass deliberately, a little tiny bit of extra feed in times of drought for them. Dig around with the digging stick, just scarify the, the top of the soil where they could always judge what was a good loamy bit of soil near a rock hole or something like that. And then they'd sprinkle the buffalo grass seed around that they'd collected and they'd then rake it over a little bit and they'd put a little bit of water on it. Most of the Afghans would have had hernias, most of them. And they never ever went and uh, had any medical treatment for them. I don't think that they would have gone to a doctor, wouldn't have thought of going to a doctor. But they used to have back problems, they all had back aches and things, because I mean, the work they did was very, very heavy work. And I can remember seeing at the Afghans, they always had these um, hernia straps hanging on the line. They kept them very clean. And I was quite a big girl before I discovered that they weren't men's underwear. Normal men didn't wear them. I was quite a big girl before I discovered that the ordinary white men never wore things like that because they didn't have hernias. All the loading and the unloading of all those heavy loads that they carried, they were all loaded and unloaded by, by the Afghans and their Aboriginal men. Everything had to be done manually. And I mean, that went on day after day, week after week, year after year. They were real men. They were real men. Because they never complained about what they had to do. They, that was their job and they went ahead and did it. It was a very, very hard, strenuous, demanding job. But I don't think they thought of it like that. I think they thought of it just as that was what they were doing. And that was what they had to do. With the arrival of motorised transport, by the 1920s, the Afghans weren't needed anymore. The Australian government told them they had to destroy their camels. Apparently they did want them to shoot them, but the Afghans wouldn't do that. They never ever did that. They just took them right out into the bush up near the Simpsons Desert and just let them go loose. They had to bid their camels goodbye, but at least they weren't destroying them. And that's where the wild camels are from now. It was once that they let go. I always think some of them were Raj's offsprings, because you know, they would have been absolutely beautiful. When the government said to the Afghans, you've got to shoot your camels, how did the Afghans react? Well, they didn't react because you didn't react to the Ferengi. Shrugged your shoulders and walked away, and just went and got their camels and took them away. You know, they'd talk amongst themselves of what was said and done, and they'd shake their heads and, no, that's not right. That's not right. Camels were the ideal things to come out here. They were God-given things for Australia because in a kind of a way they trod the earth like the Aboriginals tread it in a gentle and kindly way. That's the way I look at it. If you watch camels moving, when they put their feet down, they put down as gracefully as any ballet dancer, even with heavy loads on. Very beautiful to watch. I used to love watching the camels' feet, the way they pick them up and put them down. They walk softly on the earth. Everything's done very gently, even though they're large. They're very gentle with the earth. The corrugated iron houses that we lived in were houses that the Afghans had carried all the way from Farina to Udnadatta, from Udnadatta to Alice Springs. They were the same houses they were bringing, all the corrugated iron. Because when they put the houses together again, they were built differently, and you could see where the nails had gone through. You could lie in bed and look up and see all these nail holes and all the t corrugated iron roof. It's amazing, isn't it, really? I mean, how did it all happen and why did it happen? Just one of those things, you can only call it fate. <laughs> Ships of the desert 
was produced in honour of my ancestors. Ships of the Desert was produced by Adrian Shaw. Executive producer was Lorena Allam and it was produced with the assistance of the ABC's Regional Production Fund. Mm-hmm.